Okay, so welcome back. So we started looking at this atmospheric science. And we I introduced this subject to you in the previous class. So we'll just uh, complete this introduction and then we'll get down to chalk and talk, right? So this was an important slide which I discussed in the previous class. So the y-axis is the global mean concentration of carbon dioxide in ppm parts per million versus the time. So recordings are available probably from uh, recorded data is there probably from 1960 onwards. Of course, only 2005 we can plot up to 2013, right? So the first uh, 20 years we have from SIO. That SIO is called is the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. The Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, California, USA, right? And then from 75 onwards you also have uh, satellite measurements and so on. So you can see that uh, it is increasing very nicely but it, there are so many consequences the graph looks all right now i mean it is an increasing curve and there is a peak and a dip corresponding to the summer and the winter which is related to the photosynthesis okay because the carbon dioxide uptake the release and uptake will be controlled by uh, this whether it is spring time and spring uh, so spring summer autumn and winter all right so why is this curve very important? Because if you superimpose the global temperature, okay, along with the global carbon dioxide measurements, and carbon dioxide is fairly well dispersed in the atmosphere, which means if you make measurements in carbon dioxide in Chennai, it will be the same as what you measure in Hawaii and all and so on within limits. Okay. So the red uh, line is a carbon dioxide for which you have to read from the right hand side. Okay. So parts per million that is a red, red line. Then the global temperature increase is uh, or which is called as the anomaly okay? that is on the y axis that is also on the y axis but the scale is you have to read it from the left side. So you can see that generally there is a global temperature anomaly is increasing and now you can see that uh, there is a strong correlation between the two. So there is enough reason to believe that uh, this increase in carbon dioxide if you put it into a radiative transfer model, it will tell you how much the temperature will increase and so on. Okay, That is scientifically established but of course there are several people who will say no, no, uh, the sun's radiation is increasing or decreasing, it follows a cycle, it is not because of this and this, this. So, but uh, there is a, there is highly like, there is a high likelihood that the global temperature rise is caused because of the carbon dioxide and the time has come for us to take uh, stock of this and uh, uh, do some uh, mitigating measures okay even if the there is some certain level of commitment there is a certain level level of commitment because of the economic progress the world has made so the carbon dioxide will continue to rise but at least we we need not make the curve even more steeper okay so if you have this mitigating technologies because the earth system has got high thermal inertia it will respond slowly only so if you start making corrections you will see the effect after a couple of decades is it okay now <coughs> the mass into specific heat is so high right so yeah if you have a forcing you can estimate you can get the mass of the atmosphere and this if you have a forcing for example if you have a stainless steel ball it will uh, respond one centimeter ball it will respond very fast but the earth will take a long time to respond that is what I am saying okay the mono lova the measurements are from mono lova in Hawaii the Mauna Loa in Hawaiian language means long mountain. It is the largest volcano on earth. The carbon dioxide measurements are from Mauna Loa. Okay? So it was started with Charles Keeling who started the measurements in 1958 long before people looked at climate change. But for some reason he wanted to have accurate measurements of carbon dioxide. He started measuring okay? and it is well documented. He died in 2005. The program is being continued by his son. I think his son is also a prof. Okay? So the, the measurements are continuing. So one more important thing is the so called Antarctic, there is a typo there, it should be Antarctic ozone hole. Okay. So you can see Antarctica here, okay. 
So this blue color shows that the, there is a low ozone concentration in the Antarctic region okay. So last few decades this has been a subject of intense scrutiny people wanted to measure this. So there are various ways of measuring this uh, concentration of ozone in the atmosphere. One is to have balloons, in balloons you have some potassium iodide, the potassium iodide will react with ozone and it will discharge some electrical current. So you just have a, you have a way of measuring the ozone concentration. As the balloon goes up you can find out what is the concentration in the troposphere and the stratosphere. The other is to do the same thing by flying using aircrafts, you can have aircraft measurements of this ozone. The other stud technique would be to use satellite, okay. So if you use a satellite and uh, uh, find out what is the radiation which is received by the satellite which is a back scattering. You can have uh, two kinds of sensors on board, you can have a sensor where it will send out radiation and find out what is a reflected component, usually if it is a radar or something. It is also used for military detection of vehicles, right, you know surface to this thing, right, you have radars and all. The other is to just take the radiation which is coming out of the earth surface, the back scattering, okay. If you use this back scattering principle, then you have, you get what is called the TOMS, okay. The TOMS is the total ozone, the total ozone, total ozone mapping spectrometer which has put on some American satellites and it gave very, very reliable readings, okay. It gave very reliable readings and it was conclusively established that there is a destruction of ozone because of which harmful ultraviolet radiation enters the earth and which, has, which leads to so many other complications which we will see in the next slide, right. So this is just a picture from the internet. So this is the TOM satellite, a typical this thing. So the sensor, the sensor is placed inside and this will ozone depletion, right. So the ozone depletion and other reasons is caused by you know these chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs which are widely used in refrigerators, right. So the ozone layer what it does is the ozone if it is available in good quantity it prevents the harmful ultraviolet uh, radiation in the range of 0.27 to 32 micrometers from passing through the earth's atmosphere. So it is actually a protection, it is a, the ozone is a protection from UV light. So but then it is, so it is suspected that skin cancer, damage of plants, reduction of plankton population may all result from harmful ultraviolet light. So after intense scientific debate then the community finally agreed that we will have to do something, we have to phase out the CFCs in refrigerators. This led to what is called the Montreal Protocol where they everybody agreed to remove CFCs from refrigerators and ban CFCs. Now we do not use R11, R22 and so on, it is R134A or CFC free refrigerants, okay. Yes, so now we will get back to the blackboard. What is up? What is up? Okay. I want to get back to the board. So let us go through a brief survey of the earth's atmosphere, okay. So we look at the basic definitions and uh, start solving some simple problems. So we will divide into three. Is it okay here? Okay. So let us start with a brief survey of the Earth's atmosphere. So what is the first quantity you would like to know? We are talking about the atmosphere. Huh? Before that. Oxygen. Composition, very good. Even before that. Size, density. Right? Correct? So the first is the first is weight of unit volume of air. Okay. So the weight of weight of air exerts a downward force. Okay. This is equal to 
m into v into g right per unit volume very good this is rho into g all right what will be the atmospheric pressure force per force per unit area but this density is changing with height the acceleration to gravity may also change with it so now give me a reasonable definition for pressure mathematically the surface pressure the pressure at the surface of the earth of the earth's atmosphere ps equal to integral 0 to infinity rho g dz okay where z is the vertical coat all right So the Z is very important in atmospheric thermodynamics or atmospheric science. So can we make a reasonable assumption now to make it simpler? G is a constant. What is it I am trying to say? If G is a constant equal to G naught means what? G not. Why am I saying G not? At Z equal to zero, exactly. So at the surface of the Earth, if the acceleration to gravity is G not, which is agreed upon as nine point eight, okay, nine point eight one meters per second squared, okay. Okay, so then P S equal to where M is given by rho. Very good, rho d z. That's it. If I know how rho varies with z, I'm home. I'll be able to calculate the mass of the atmosphere. Okay. So please take down problem number one. Please take down problem number one. If the globally average surface pressure, if the globally average surface pressure. Is nine point eight five into ten to the power of four pascals. The globally average surface pressure is nine point eight five into ten to the power of four pascals, and the radius of the Earth is. And the radius of the Earth is six point three seven into ten to the power of six meters. Within brackets, average value because. Within brackets, average value. Why it is flattened at the poles and all that, right? Six point three seven ten to the power of six meters. Estimate the mass of the atmosphere. Estimate the mass of the atmosphere. Okay. So I'll enter the data here.
what did I give globally averaged? Surface pressure, that is P naught. 9 point? Mm. Mm. So, which equation will you use? Third. <coughs> yeah, please watch out the units of M. What do you get? Huh? 1.004 into the 4? 10 to the power. Kilogram? No, no. Kilogram? Per, per meter square. square. Per meter square. Okay. 1.004 and complete the part B of the problem. If the radius of the earth is so on, so what is the total mass of the atmosphere? So, this is per unit area. What is the area then? Assuming the earth to be a sphere, 4 pi r e square. So, multiply this by 4 pi r e square. So, kilogram per meter square into meter square, meter square, meter square will get cancelled. You will get so many tons, giga tons, whatever tons. Okay. So this just gives you an idea of how big the atmosphere is. So, I will go back here. How much is it? 5.1 to the power of 18 kg. So, this is the amount of air above us. Okay. Okay. A huge number. Okay. So, you got an idea of the total mass of air out of the 23 percent is oxygen. So, it is good for us. Right, <laughs> but this carbon dioxide is in increasing and all that, that is the source of trouble. But now, let us look at somebody said what are the important quantities we want to look at? Somebody said the chemical composition. So, the next will be the next thing to look at will be the chemical composition of the earth's atmosphere. Okay, please note that we are not doing planetary atmospheric science, it is earth's atmospheric science. Okay, we can do complete study, we can do of Venus, Mars, and all that. Okay, but data and all is not available. You have to use telescopic data, some other data, spectroscopic data and figure out and we are interested in our lesser models, we are interested only in our earth's atmosphere. Okay. So, we will concentrate on the earth's atmosphere. Is this clear? Okay. Now, I will give you a table which gives you the chemical composition of the earth's atmosphere. I have to use this. So, we can avoid PowerPoint, we can just use it. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 12.
ओके सो कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट मॉलिकुलर वेट एंड देन Oh, it started. Okay, so the various constituents we have listed: nitrogen, oxygen, argon, water vapor, carbon dioxide, helium, methane, krypton, hydrogen, nitrous oxide, and ozone. Okay, so the molecular weights: most of these you know. Nitrogen is 28, oxygen is 32, argon is 40, water is 18, carbon dioxide is 44, helium is 4, methane is 16. krypton we'll have to see 84 hydrogen is 2 nitrous oxide no n2 o 44 44 it's the same as carbon dioxide no o3 is 48 so let us look at the concentrations These are all uh, trace gases. So, in parts per million, okay. Please take down this table. Then we'll start looking into this. what can you infer from this first point uh, nitrogen is uh, dominant and all that is obvious it's a dumb something little more sir nitrogen is 78 oxygen is okay it is there from the table what can you read what can you read between the lines the earth's atmosphere is dominated by diatomic mo diatomic molecules the earth's atmosphere is dominated by diatomic molecules point number 1 there's too much of nitrogen is inert gas there's too much of nitrogen all around but the saving grace is there's about 21% oxygen which is required for the sustenance of life photosynthesis whatever okay now i have circled a few with uh, pink color chalk piece what are these they are all greenhouse gases very good okay all these fellows are
ओके प्रॉब्लम नंबर टू प्लीज टेक डाउन प्रॉब्लम नंबर टू बेस्ड ऑन द केमिकल कॉम्पोजिशन ऑफ द अर्थ एटमोस्फियर based on the chemical composition of the earth's atmosphere given in the table determine the molecular weight of atmospheric air based on the chemical composition of the earth's atmosphere given in the table determine the molecular weight of atmospheric air so you may choose to drop you may choose to drop irrelevant gases okay please please start is the problem clear hmm. so that will be problem number 2 Say that again. Twenty-nine point two. Huh? Okay. So it depends on up to which first three. Water zero to five percent. Then it will give. So this zero to five percent, sir, you will say seventy-eight point one, twenty point point nine, and five is exceeding hundred. So all the other. So what does it mean? So all this chemical composition on the, is on the basis of dry air. the chemical composition is on the basis of dry air 0 to 5% it may be there if you have to that means you have to consider moist air so in saudi arabia it may be 0% somewhere it may be 4% in singapore it so that 0 to 5% is a normal concentration of atmospheric water vapor now this it is on dry air basis okay so forget the water vapor don't use it all right so if you do that what do you get ah so molecular weight Equal to twenty-eight into point seven eight one plus. Okay, so I'm just converting it into fraction. Point seven eight one into twenty-eight plus. We'll include this argon fellow also, right? Forty into point zero zero nine. Twenty-eight point nine one. Actually, we in thermodynamics we learned it at twenty-eight point nine seven. No, that's okay. Twenty-eight point nine two. Ah, huh? okay. Kg per kg mole. That's what you study. Is it correct? Hmm. Kg per kg per mole. Kg per kilo mole. Kg per kilo mole. Correct. Okay, fine. So it is about twenty-eight point nine seven. So it is between oxygen and nitrogen. The molecular weight is between. It is very close to. It's closer to nitrogen than oxygen. Pos, basically because this nitrogen is too much. Okay. Problem number three. convert the volumetric analysis convert the volumetric analysis of the chemical composition of the atmosphere of the earth and all that right convert the volumetric analysis of the earth's atmosphere to a gravimetric analysis 
So, the instead of volume basis, you have, you have mass basis. Okay. Mm. Can you do this? Please do it. That is problem number three. So, to do gravimetric analysis, what is the first part? You have to get the molecular weight, which you already got in problem number two. Correct? So, the driller he gave up, is it? Or? Huh? Mm. Yeah, please tell me nitrogen. We will make it seventy eight point one. How much is it? Seventy five point. O2 Somewhere you read in school it's 23 percent you have to get it now Ah then it's safe 23 point How much are you getting Okay We'll take argon also huh 40.9 is some one point huh? what is sigma Ninety nine point? Okay. Sigma should not exceed hundred, then we are in trouble. Right? He is back. Uh, sigma hundred? Ninety nine point nine? Ninety nine point? Okay. Okay. So this is basically the uh, concentration, this is the chemical composition. The water vapor is highly variable ranging from 10 parts per million in a desert region. It can range up to 5 percent water vapor in a very, very in a tropical region and so on. N2 and O2 are diatomic molecules which basically uh, determine largely this uh, molecular weight and all that. They are the dominating this thing. And, uh, gas molecules with certain structures interact with radiation okay that is they are capable of absorbing radiation and because of which it leads to the uh, they absorb radiation selectively that is their ability to reflect radiation and their ability to absorb radiation varies with the wavelength okay so this leads to lot of disturbances which means they are allowing the solar radiation which is short wave radiation incoming short wave radiation they are allowing to come. So, this heats up the earth, but whatever is going out of the earth is a long wave radiation. It is because of the means dis means displacement law, which we will study later. Atmospheric radiation I will teach you later. So, this outgoing short wave radiation, these fellows block and they are not able to get past the atmosphere because of which there is a continuous buildup of this uh, radiation. They act like a heat shield and therefore, the global temperatures are increasing. Is it okay? So, as the carbon dioxide concentration increases, this will this will have a positive feedback that will continue to increase, right. So, this will keep on, there will be a feedback, okay, do I equal to whatever, you will have a feedback and it will keep on increasing, all right. Now, the next will be the vertical structure of the earth.
earth is atmosphere. It is clear up to this stage. So, the pressure decreases with height okay? and the mean surface and the surface pressure is about P naught. And to a large extent, this can be calculated using the simple relation. What is it? Let us follow a global equation number, at least for lecture wise. What will be the equation number for today's class? 5? Okay. Okay, so the pressure decreases exponentially with depth, okay, and H is called the E folding depth. z equal to h what happens ah p equal to please use your calculators and let me know what this value is point yes point 0.63 So, the E folding depth is the depth at which or the height at which the atmospheric pressure reduces to 63 percent of the pressure at z equal to 0 or at the surface. So, the h is something, h is basically a scale height for the atmosphere. It is a scale height. Just like you have, if you put a mercury in glass thermometer in a patient's mouth, the doctor waits for 2 minutes because he has to be reasonably confident that 99, it is close to 99 percent of the true value. Okay? So, there is something called a time constant for the thermometer. Like this, the earth has got a, the earth has got a scale height which is given by h. This is usually in kilometers. Okay? Okay? Problem number 4, so this will be the style in this course, it is okay. We will solve simple, simple problems, slowly it will become more difficult, but it will not get as difficult as your heat transfer or we will not solve non-linear partial differential equations and all. But through problems, we will learn the signs, all right. At approximately what height, problem number 4, at approximately what height above sea level? At approximately what height above sea level? It is given by z half. I call this as z half. At approximately what height above the sea level z half does half of the mass of the atmosphere at approximately what height above sea level given by z half? Does half of the mass of the atmosphere lie above and half lies below? At what height z half does half of the mass of the atmosphere lie above and below it? Correct? 
assume h to be 8 kilometers assume h to be 8 kilometers and g is 9.81 meters per second square assume assume h assume h to be 8 kilometers and g to be 9.81 meters per second square throughout don't try to integrate and make it make life difficult for you okay please solve it so we can work on that further So, the pressure itself is a proxy for the mass, right? So, you can take ln of 0.5, right? That is what you are looking at, right? So, the solution to this problem is. So, it is very interesting, we worked out the total mass of the atmosphere is 5 point, earth's atmosphere is 5.11 into 10 to the power of 18 kg, okay. So, 2.56 into 10 to the power of 18 kg is within the first 5 and a half kilometers of the atmosphere and from 5 and a half kilometers to infinity is the remaining 2.55 into 10 to the power of 18. So, the atmosphere is very dense in the first few kilometers, this is an important concept you have to understand. So, most of many of the so your thunderstorm cyclones all these analysis we are restricting only to 0 to 20 kilometers more than that and about 10 or 20, 12 kilometers generally you do not expect weather only cumulonimbus storm that is why commercial aircraft fly at 12 or 13 kilometers there will be severe thunderstorms where you will have a chance to navigate around the thunderstorm okay and some aircrafts can pass through the thunderstorms also generally why that a civil aviation the 12 kilometers is fixed is most of the clouds are below the 12 kilometers, the really dangerous ones which lead to the typhoons and those things will extend up to 14 to 18 kilometers, but they will have a tower like this. So, it will be 100 or 200 kilometers, the pilot has a chance to navigate around that if his radar is working properly and he is interested in, <laughs> in doing that, okay. So, we will stop here. So, it is quite interesting. So, we will look at other uh, in tomorrow's class, we will look at what is the vertical structure of the temperature? This is the vertical structure of the pressure. What is the vertical st structure of the temperature? We look at troposphere, tropopause, stratosphere, stratopause, mesos mesosphere and all that. After all these discussions, then we look at the other important components in this, namely the ice which is the cryosphere, then the earth's crust, mantle. This will be a couple of classes that will complete the introduction okay, to the various systems of the earth's various players in the earth's climate. Then after 2-3 weeks, we will get into atmospheric thermodynamics which will be the mainstay of this, which will be the main course of this course. So, we look at atmospheric thermodynamics, try to study everything from thermodynamics angle and then we will go to radiation and atmospheric dynamics. <laughs>